In this episode of SMA's Fireside Chats, we take a look at earning stripes. Sorry, Nir, can you tell us a bit about that one? And so this was a great conversation between a group of basic leader course students at Fort Carson, uh, where we really kind of talked about what does it mean to become an NCO and what are some of those difficult conversations or difficult decisions that they might have to make as a leader. So really looking forward to this, and I hope everyone's able to get a little something out of it. But what we're going to do, we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So the first question is, you're about to be, hopefully, you're all about to be a young sergeant. Okay? So I want you to think of, it's a positive. What is one thing that you think that you're ready to do, that the Army's gotten you ready to do, to be a sergeant? Okay? That's a positive thing, not a negative. Yes? You want to clarify it on my question already? I thought you were asking. Oh, you're ready to go. I'm going to pull out my notebook. I'm going to take notes. I'm not going to say a lot. So and I'll, I'll, work, I'll try real hard not to say anything. The second round, you're going to tell me one thing you think you're not ready to do. Once we uh, do your positive, then I'll do my positive. And I'll do my positive from, I don't know, one billion years ago before you were born when I made my sergeant. So I got promoted to sergeant and. I think 1989. When I look back, you know, 30, uh, I made sergeant um, with 18 months in the Army. And that was very fast. Um, I, I'd come in the Army a little early, so I was 19, I'd been to college. Had good grades. I didn't fail out. Uh, I ran out of money, but uh, I was I was doing extremely well in college, um, and enjoyed it. But then recruiter had me call and joined the army. So, but the reason now this is going to come to head, uh, you know, like how did you? Why are you talk, talking about you know a sergeant? And you're talking about when you came in the army. Well, for some reason, I don't know why. When I went to basic training, they made me the platoon guy. Well, as a 13 Bravo, it's OSUT. So I was the only platoon guide in my basic training class, in my group. So they never fired me, they didn't switch me out. So for 13 weeks, I was the platoon guide. So at the, some point, I think uh, the other privates was like, man, you're just as mean as the drill sergeants. I said, well, because I had to do push-ups every time y'all did something wrong. So I think the Army had really prepared me. By that time, I had marched troops, um, you know, I kind of got them where they needed to be. I got them in the uniform and I got yelled at if they weren't. I got harassed by the drill sergeants constantly for 13 weeks. Um, and I think that really, you know, by the time I got sergeant, I was like, oh, I, I know how to do that. I was, I've been doing it for like two years now. Uh, so I thought I was really well prepared um, to be a sergeant. I was really nervous about it. Um, and I, I wanted to be the absolute best version I could be of myself. And I was, I was like, man, you know, I still remember this very clearly um, that, you know, maybe we'd go out and party a lot as a young specialist in private. So I said, I probably, I need to do less than that. You know, I need to, you know, I've got to be the role model as a young sergeant. And I, I really felt that I'd been prepared to do that. And I felt like I was, you know, but I, I still remember that very clearly that I wanted to be the, you know, the role model that they had all looked up to. Um, and I think I was ready for that. I think the Army had put me in all those positions all the way from basic training. AIT was all one big glob of stuff. And then even in my next unit that I thought I was, I was ready to do that, I thought. Um, we'll talk about the other part in a minute. But uh, I thought I was ready to do that. And, but I was really... Um, I, I kind of was really thinking I had to be ready and respected and and what was hard for me there is um, I was ready for it but also I made it very quickly so my roommate was still a PFC and I was a sergeant <laughs> so uh, so that's another reason imagine that I was that's who I was gonna be the sergeant for was like my roommate I mean this we went to basic training together um, so that, that was hard, uh, but I think the Army had done well because as in basic training as a private, there were other privates, we were all privates, and I was a tune guide, so they kind of prepared me to do that. It's just that now, at that point, I just had, now I had a different rank. 
uh, which is a little different uh, than being a PFC with a little badge that says platoon guy on it. So good, you ready for round two? So what do you think you're not ready for? I think one of the biggest things that I was not prepared for, I was in a different kind of unit. So I was in, uh, as a 13 Bravo, you can go to, uh, you can go to a service battery, you can be in a gun battery. I actually was not on a gun line, I was in the, the support unit. And I didn't think I was ready exactly to be a gunner. And I was like really adamant that I wanted to be on a gun line. And so I actually went and I said, hey, I want to I wanna go to the gun line. But like uh, anybody has a, a good soldier fit, um, you know, I did well in fitness. I thought I was relatively smart at my job. They're like, we don't want you to go. I was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> but I need to go do hands-on on my core task. And, um, you know, I thought I knew it well with basic training. So those that said subject matter expert, I, I, um, I really wanted to be the subject matter expert. And I think the only way I could do that is I had to go get my hands on and be the gunner. Because uh, I, when I got to my first unit, I wasn't a gunner on a gun crew. Um, and then you're a sergeant, and then you're gonna be a gunner on a gun crew, and you've never done it. I'm like, this is really awkward. Uh, so I really, really, really wanted to do that, and I think I was ready. So I dug in real hard. Um, I clearly, <laughs> I did okay. <laughs> so I think I did all right. Um, so that's probably the one thing uh, for me that I really look back, but I probably got a thousands. So I want to tell you a little story. I do like to read a lot now. Um, and I read this, and I think there was one thing that I didn't think I was doing well as the Sergeant Major of the Army was listening. So somebody that said, um, you know, I, I, you got to be able to learn, right? You, gotta, you still got to grow. I've been trying to learn how to do my job as the Sergeant Major of the Army uh, since I've been the Sergeant Major of the Army. And every job I've gone into, I've tried to do better and learn. So anybody thinks that you're going to become the Sergeant Major of the Army and you're automatically going to know what you're going to do, you're incorrect. But I would also say the same thing about being a young sergeant. When I was a young sergeant, you know, like I said, I, I laid it out there. I mean, I did not know how to be a gunner and for a 13 Bravo sergeant, that's like, you know, chapter you out of the Army kind of moment, like you're incompetent. Um, but that's what I would say is that the reason I take those notes now, because I read this book and I don't think I was truly listening, and that's a technique that I would encourage you all to do, is how do you really listen to the person in front of you? And that exercise I learned as the Sergeant Major of the Army, to be a better listener. Not to interrupt, to truly listen to what people are actually telling you. And I got that from reading a book. So that's the reason I do it that way, is that's me trying to be a really good listener to what you're saying and not trying to respond to what you're saying, to hear what you're saying. Um, and I'll share a story uh, about this. So this was me trying to learn, but I got this a couple years ago. So a couple years ago, we had a small problem with Fort Hood. I think everybody knows that, right? So I read the book and I said, I'm gonna try this out. And I said, we're gonna go around, I'm gonna say what, and I, the question then was, what, what's one thing you think is positive about Fort Hood? And this is right after, I don't, actually I know exactly what day it was, it's January 6th. Um, yeah, same day, you know, I saw a bunch of people run through the Capitol. So I actually was on Fort Hood that day. Um, so that's how I can remember the day. So I, and I had a small group, we were in a round circle, not the way we're at now, and then they were all the way around me, and we started here and went around, and I took notes. And then at the end, I took more notes, and then I opened up just like I am with you and said, hey, what do you want to talk about? And somehow it come out. I mean, they were very emotional, right? It was emotional time. Um, you know, it was really difficult conversations, and it was. It was. We, we all had emotion. I had some. They had some. And then at some point... Somebody, and they were really brutally honest, and I hope you all too are too, is that they said, well, one soldier in the group said, I think you're here to check the block. And, and that's what they said to me. And you know, they, that like cut deep, you know, like I was like, 
I mean, that's, you know, that's not who I am. You know, it's, I, I don't know if I'll ever convince you of that in the next hour or two. It's just not who I am. But that hurt. I mean, like, that hurt bad, you know. It really hurt badly. Um, so I said, okay, that's fair. I really appreciate that. And then I said, I'm going to ask everybody in the group. And I want you to be honest. And, uh, you know, and so I started over. And I said, then we're all in a circle. And this one said, yep, I think you're here to check the blog. Yep, 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 yep. And then about halfway, as weird as it was, it was about halfway, somebody said no. I said, because you actually took notes. You were actually listening. And I think you're here because you actually want to make it better on Fort Hood. And then it went around, and then completely after that, it was almost everybody said, no, I think you're really here. And it was just something so simple of me taking notes. So, and, and learning how to listen better. And that's me trying to grow to be a better Sergeant Major of the Army. And that'd be some really good advice that I would give my young Sergeant self. I was terrible at it. <laughs> so uh, so uh, that's, um, that's uh, one of the reasons that I do take these notes. Um, they're my notes, I can go back and reference them. But I encourage you to do that. But that's also something I would tell my younger Sergeant self. Uh, I was not a good listener. Um, I think my problem was, um, and my wife explains this to me all the time. She says a lot of times, said, you're not normal. <laughs> I said, okay. Um, but I think I am. In my mind, everybody should be able to do this. And uh, what I found out, I'm still not sure I found that out. <laughs> so I think everybody has, should be able to do this and whatever I'm doing. And then again, my wife says, you're not normal. Most people don't do that. I'm like, yes, they do. I did it. I'm old. What are you talking about? And then she explains to him again, I still don't understand. So I had that when I was a young sergeant. Like, if I ran, you know, 11 minute, two mile, my expectation was every soldier underneath my care should run 11 minute, two mile. <laughs> and, and it wasn't to the point of, like, oh, it's kind of a good idea. It was a, like, no, I'm going to run you until you can do this. And they're like, but most people can't do that. And I said, I don't care. You're under my unit. So I had this really high standard, um, maybe unreasonably so, as a young sergeant. Um, and I, I really pushed people to that other level. Um, I had to learn that maybe I'm not normal. I still think I'm normal. Um, So, I've got a lot of notes. I circled some things on your first comments. Uh, growth Mindset says you should always raise your hand because um, it's not because you're afraid to fail. It's because you want to learn. So, uh, you would immediately have gotten a coin if you'd raised your hand. Because in a group, most people go, oh, I don't want to say, look at mine because you'll single me out and you might say something that you know, you don't like, and it'd be a get me, and then, so don't be afraid to do that. You should always, everybody should immediately, now on the next one, you can't immediately raise your hand. Uh, but I encourage you always to do that. If you get an opportunity, and you're in front of the, the oldest, like, enlisted person in the Army, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I would really like you to know mine. It's not because you, you do that so that you want to grow. And that's called a growth mindset. And there's a really good book by Carol Dweck out there uh, called Mindsets. I encourage you to read it. Um, highly recommend it. Okay. So my first question, and then I, I'll follow up in a dialogue. Uh, empathize with soldiers. And I'll ask, not the person that asked it, um, can you tell me, so somewhere on the back row, can you tell me what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? It's a, it's a difficult line, right? Um, so I heard a couple of times this empathize. Sometimes you, I think we almost lead to sympathy as opposed to empathy. And, and I'd caution on those two words is, uh, when I hear this sometimes, I wanna be able to empathize. Now, I'm not sure another one of those my own flaws, like I would, I don't think I had an empathetic or sympathetic bone in my body as a sergeant. Um, 
I really didn't. Uh, and I really needed to learn how to do that, but it was, it was neither, I didn't have either one. It was like, here's the standard, execute, run that two miles in 11 minutes, or you're gonna have to do some retraining. But, you know, but Sergeant, you know, I passed the Army, I said, hey, that was mine. So, um, but I caution you, because sometimes we try to put these two words together, and then it leads to, imagine a, another scenario, is you have to tell somebody the person behind that door may kill you. But I still have to tell you to go through that door. Right? I mean, you can use empathetic, sympathetic, but at that point, can you make that decision? For one of your soldiers, I want you to go through the door and I'm not sure you'll live. So that's why I, you know, um, I, I, that's a really hard thing, you know, decision as a sergeant, right? And why do I say it with these two words is sympathy and empathy. Um, I would ask you as a young sergeant, you should know your soldiers. You should know the standards. But at some point in time, there will be difficult decisions to be made. And... You know, when I hear while I'm being empathetic, well, are you willing to take that same person and say, you got to go through the door, people are going to die. You may die. I don't know, because I'm not sure what's on the other side of that. But you got to go, and you got to go now. So the, you have to be able to say, we care for them no matter what. And this leads to that other part, right? I think a lot of people said, how do I not go in the first one through the door? Uh, right? That was another thing that was on the second part. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. But the, remember those two words is how do you become the leader that you can be. You can empathize with them, but remember you're still the leader that might have to make that hard decision. Okay? And that's one thing on the... Um, you need to make sure you, you come to grips with, especially uh, you can't get, you can be empathetic in the situation, but in other words, at some point in time, we have a mission to go do, right? If the, you know, I'll think of 1-3, 1st Brigade, a 3rd ID last year when Russia invaded Ukraine. We're like, okay, we need to get on a plane. When? Like right now. But we just got back from Korea. I can empathize with you. I do. I can completely understand. However, the, the president through the Secretary of Defense has just ordered to send a brigade. Your brigade is the most ready brigade we have in the Army, and we need you to get on the plane right now. And that's a decision that actually was made last year. And that brigade literally just got back from Korea three months later, earlier. So think about that. You know, I can understand. I've been there. It's really hard. I know it sucks. But I'm, we have to make these decisions. So remember, when you, when you put yourself in those situations, can you empathize, but not to the point that you can't make that decision if one three has to deploy? Okay? Okay, good. Uh, another pause. Lead, I really like the one, lead my soldiers the right way. Not lead my soldiers, but lead my soldiers the right way. I think as a sergeant, I, and I struggled with that. I didn't know if I was right or wrong. Sometimes I look back as the old man in me and go, man, I screwed that up. If I, if I said, if you said you were my first sergeant or below, I usually start by apologizing. Remember those standards and everybody should, I, I ran somebody 10 miles one time and they fell out. I thought they were like, the, I was like, okay, you're going to run another 10 miles. Like, but I just ran 10 miles. So everybody, remember, there's, I did it, so everybody else should do it. Um, so I, I, I really like the right way. And what I'd say to you, too, on that one is don't be afraid to get it wrong. But lead starts you said it lead the right way so start with the word lead but don't be afraid to lead either because you didn't get it the right way right you're gonna make mistakes ah, I got so many I mean I had a little bit of bad language <laughs> at one point uh, so uh, 
one of my soldiers is, and I said something probably I shouldn't have said, it was a swear word, and the soldier came up to me and said, I don't like that word. It was a swear word, so I'm not going to use it. He said, I don't like that word and I don't appreciate that you said that to me. So remember, lead the right way. I was not leading the right way. But the soldier did not report me to IG, didn't report me to somewhere. It just told me how they felt. Now I had a choice, right? I could say, well, I'm the sergeant and I, you know, yell at him and do this. I could. I, you know, at that time I probably, you know, really probably thought about it. <laughs> uh, but I didn't. I said, I, want, you're, I respected that I was wrong and I should lead the right way. And um, believe it or not, I never used that word with that individual again. I can't, I'd like to say I never used that word again, but I didn't. Um, and so I really like that right way. But I will tell you, if you get it wrong, and most of the time your soldiers do believe that you're good, then they'll, they'll give you some leeway. And that's, that was a soldier that clearly I was wrong. And they corrected me. Now I think, and I'm just guessing, if I had not tried to be better and lead the right way, and I did it again, thought, well, I don't care. I, I don't think I'd be the Sergeant Major Army. I think they would have done something different to me. But there's been multiple times in my career where I clearly thought I was wrong. And a soldier made the correction on me, and I was the leader. To include as a drill sergeant. A private told me, he said, I think you were wrong, drill sergeant. And, you know, as a drill sergeant, you know, yeah, I want to bow up. <laughs> I didn't. Because I thought I was wrong. And you as a young sergeant, you have to immediately identify that. And that's why I really like that right way part. Lead the right way. Um, create a difference. That's another one I really liked. Um, here, I've, I've always believed that. Is one person can make a difference in the world. You might do it one person at a time. But make a difference. So whoever said that, I thought that was outstanding. Um, I thought they were all good, by the way. Um, And reading to, to teach and learn, that was another one. I've been a lifelong learner. Um, I 100% believe that. I was a young sergeant. I'd read as much as I could. I wanted to know every manual in the Army. And uh, I think at some point, I think I did. I think I'd read them all. Uh, I think I almost memorized all of them. I went to a lot of boards. Uh, I stopped counting at 19. I don't know, I don't know. It's, I called it the big ears. It's like, hey, you go to the NCO board. Oh, you go to the NCO quarter board. And then you go, and then I, I screwed up in PCS, and then I started over again. I'm like, man, could y'all stop? It's like, yeah, but you're really good at it. I was like, yeah, but anyway, so I read a lot. I, I read both uh, personally and professionally. Um, I, I thought at some point I'd really led every manual in the Army. I knew when people were wrong, they hated that. When I was a young sergeant, young staff sergeant, I knew like all the regs. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to do that too. Because I think one thing is an army, we're not doing well. So whoever said that really highlighted that. That was me, I loved it. Ooh, here's one though. Put people first. I, and I, I said I wouldn't single you out, but I got it. Who said that? Okay, we got to talk about this one. What does that mean? You've got a single parent and your unit has to deploy. Like right now, what do you do? It's hard, right? We're going to replay this scenario, right? You're the first sergeant. You've got a soldier, single parent, and you're, you're you're, you're now on a mission, and we said, the Army, it says, your unit is ready to deploy. What do you do? Sorry. We said people first, so I, this is kind of, I want to clarify this. What do you mean? We're, what resources are we going to do? I, I, um, I, I like the comment, people first. Um, 
clearly I do, so my boss told me people first, so it's the chief of staff of the army, this told me, anyway. Um, so, but I think what I'd ask you to do is don't new use it, it's like this bumper sticker for everything, right? That's what I would ask. I, I like the comment, but I'd ask you to clarify that. And you should clarify what that means to your people as a young sergeant and what it doesn't mean. Um, having been a young single sergeant, I lived in the barracks for like seven years. And then I tell you, nothing was more frustrating. Let's say, hey, we need to go do this in the motor pool. Hey, can you pull CQ? I know you're not married. Hey, can you go? Uh, I didn't lock my vehicle. Hey, can I'm like, okay, you know what? You know, is there anybody else in the Army that can do something other than Sergeant Grinston? I'm really sick of it. So, uh, is that fair? And that's a weird question because I don't like the word fair. But we, we use this word sometimes and we don't clarify what we mean by people first. You know, I have, you're part of my unit. What I'd really like to you to say is I have completely prepared that so I had done my job as a team leader, a first sergeant, that they had a family care plan. That's what it means to be people first. But you all immediately went down the road of, oh, maybe they don't deploy. That's not what people first means. It's the same thing. You got to go through the door. I'm sorry. People might die. Um, but that's our mission. But what I'd ask you to do is, did you prepare your soldiers for the mission? That's people first. Not that they don't have to do the mission. And I think a lot of times we go down this road of, we don't have to put the tank engine in the tank. No, we actually do have to do that. It's not people first. It's like, yeah, but I need the tank. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know what I mean? So, but do you have to do it on Friday night and I'm not going anywhere? Do, you know, do we all have to stay out late to do this? So in other words, think of you still have to do the mission, but how could you accomplish it that way, the right way, right? Do the things the right way. So you, you know, my, I, I had done, you know, and I know it's hard because you've never been a first sergeant. You'd said, I'd done my job is that I'd take their family care plan. I knew where they had to go and we were prepared for that. That's what it means for people first, not that they don't have to do the mission. We just have to train them that things are going to come up. They're going to be hard. They're dangerous. We're Army. I don't know what to tell you. Um, and that's all compost. You know, active, guard, reserve. I mean, National Guard and Army Reserve got called up like for three years, it feels like. They were all doing something. COVID, forest fires, hurricanes, civil unrest, you name it. Um, so you all have to be prepared. I think that's what we forget in people first. It's not, you don't have to do anything. You have to prepare your people. I, like I, I got a story for everything you say almost. Um, so I was a brigade sergeant major one time and I was walking down. Um, I was in I was in Afghanistan, I was in combat, and this goes to your point about you gotta check on them. So I was walking down, I was actually getting ready to go on a on a patrol. I had a, my kid on, I was gonna get some breakfast. Anybody going out in combat, you're like, I gotta eat because you never know. Might be my last meal. So uh so we're going out and a uh, young soldier, young to me anyway, starting first class, but you know, I was like, Hey, how's it going? She's like, uh, it's okay. It's odd. Everybody lies to the sergeant major. It's like, it's great, sergeant major. <laughs> so um, I was like, hey, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. I'm going to get some food, but I want you to come see me. I, it's 1700. Hopefully I'll be back, but, you know, um, but come see me. She comes in and we work through, and I said, I got a sense there's something going on. Now, she did not, she was in the brigade. She wasn't like in the brigade headquarters. She's just a soldier of the brigade. And, um, I said, I really got this sense like something's going on. And we had a good conversation, going through a hard divorce, uh, really was struggling. You know what she said at the end? You're the only one that noticed. I'm like, I get, there's 4,000 people in a brigade, if you hadn't figured that out. I just happened to ask her, hey, how's it going? And, and then I was mindful enough to actually pick up that, you know, there was something there. So I agree with you. Uh, take care of your people isn't just, yep, we got the family care plan and never check on it again. And it's not just sitting down taking notes one time because you asked them a question. It's every day. You look people in the eye and really notice what's happening right in front of you, especially at your level. So what, here's my experience in 36 years. 
People will tell you everything you need to know if you just listened. They may not say it with their words. They'll say it with their eyes, their expressions, sit in the back. But they may never tell you a word, but they'll always tell you what's going on. You have to watch them. I got thousands of stories. I'll give you another one. No words this time. I was, I was the Sergeant Major of the Army. Small group. A soldier had just died. Um, it was a young woman at Fort Bliss. And I was curious. I was like, this is, you know. So let me go out. So I go to Fort Bliss. I'm in another small group like this. Again, we're circles because that's I like circles. This young woman sitting right here not saying a word to me. And I said, hey, what's going on? So a soldier had just died in that unit. So I expected this outpouring of emotion and stuff. And they were asking me about this is my squad, and army body composition. I was like, this is odd. You know, you, a soldier died. I, I expected, you know, how this happened, you know. This young woman was sitting right in front of me doing this. Like, I was like, I go, are you okay? She didn't say a word. She just stopped. And they're like, and the soldier next to her goes, Sergeant Major, we can't talk to you because uh, all the officers and NCOs in the room, we can't tell you how we really feel. I said, okay, if you're an officer and NCO, get out. Like right now. They're like, Sergeant Major. I'm Sergeant Major the Army, get out. So, so uh, she, it, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? It was not in the news. Nobody heard about this case. Uh, so what I couldn't imagine, like, what would have happened if I wouldn't have been there? What would have happened if I wouldn't have noticed that that was just weird? And after that, it was outpouring of emotion, and they felt like nobody had talked to them, you know, like, honestly about what had happened. And I did. I had an honest conversation about everything I knew that had happened. Um, and then I told the Division Sergeant Major he had to go spend some time with that unit. And I said, who do you trust? And I said, we trust the Battalion Sergeant Major. So I said, I'm going to bring him in and make sure you talk to him. She wasn't saying anything of words, but it was that one little thing. I think you all have to watch that too. Uh, soldiers, will, I think, my personal opinion, they will always tell you what's going on. They're just not going to say anything with words. It's, it's super hard to know the why. Um, and we can't always tell you. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm standing here, I know like why behind everything almost, but, um, and, and I'll tell you, sometimes it starts all the way up here to, with me, Department of the Army, on the, some of the why and some of this stuff, we can't even tell you. Yes. Like seriously, there's some things like, I can't tell you everything, you know, like why we're doing this. Um, could be to prevent war. <laughs> so. Um, so I, I think I really, I, I really struggle with that because there's this, as a young sergeant, I'll just use myself as an example, I didn't know the why. Um, and there's a generational gap, I think. So really old senior leaders in the, in the Army, you know, we were never told why. It's like, hey, just go execute, don't question, just go for it. And that's the way the Army was at the time. And, and we grew up in that, we think it's right. But you all and, and your soldiers want to know why. But there's sometimes we can't tell you why. You know, it may be top secret, it could be secret, even though people are putting stuff on the internet. But, uh, um, but some of that is, it's really hard to understand sometimes the why, especially as a young sergeant. Try to reason it out, and sometimes you don't even know that the why they're giving you is completely wrong. Isn't that right, Specialist Spence, right? So Specialist Spence and I were downstairs. Um, she's like, Sergeant Major, you know, talk about me. This is, I'm sorry, you, you're, you're, everybody in the room is uh, one of my stories. So, um, so we were sitting downstairs. And uh, she goes, yeah, yeah, I've been boarded. I'm, um, she moved from Army Guard, um, Army Reserve. Do you know, does anybody know, I'm talking about Specialist Spence. Uh, she's the former uh, Miss Colorado. Um, she got out, um, now she's an Army Reserve soldier. And she was a uh, 4th ID, right? She's right here. Um, so she and I have talked before, she's going to go do an event with me. And um, up in uh, Denver, we're going to talk to JRTC, or it's a drill competition. So we're sitting down, 
I'm waiting for you all to come in here. And she goes, Sergeant Major, I've been boarded and um, I just want to go to BLC. I'll get promoted to Sergeant. I said, oh, when's that going to happen? She goes, next June. I'm like, why next June? It's like, ah, oh, my unit doesn't have any slots for BLC. And what did I say? There are slots. There are slots. And that's not true. And she goes, well, that's what I was told, right? So that goes back to you don't know that when I'm sitting here going, we got a ton of slides. And then, I, of course, the, literally the Army, United States Army Reserve CSM is here. And he goes walking by, and I'm Sergeant Major. I'm Sergeant Major, come on over here. I'm like, hey, this young specialist needs to go to school. And she goes, yeah, I was told I didn't get slots. And he goes, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> so uh, he said the exact same thing I did. So we were going to get a slot. She's going to go to school in uh, June. But you don't know that. That's, that's hard for you to know the why. I see every slot for BLC in the Army. I know we didn't fill all our slots last month, the month before that, the month before that. She doesn't know that. Her squad leader doesn't know that. The first sergeant probably doesn't know to tell her the why she can't go to school. And we're going to fix that. The only thing I would ask you all to do as a young sergeant, though, is challenge the why. Don't be afraid to challenge it, though, right? So you want to know, and if they're good leaders, they'll take time, if there is time, to explain why. And if they can't, keep asking. Right? So, and I'll go back to Special Spence's case. Why didn't the platoon sergeant say, why don't we have slots? Like, seriously, is that true? Like, yeah, my unit doesn't have slots, but the whole army doesn't have a slot for BLC. They never asked why. Was that correct? And then if they can't tell you, keep going. That's the best advice I can give you as a young sergeant. And then somebody else said it too, know which fights to fight. I think somebody said that, right, somebody? Uh, which one, it's kind of hard, which, you know, you can't fight them all, actually you can. I did. <laughs> I did a lot of push-ups. <laughs> I'll let you know now, I did a lot of push-ups. As a young sergeant, I was constantly doing it, because I challenged everybody on the why. I was, <laughs> I was really stubborn, and I knew the regs, so I said, well, you know, in AR, blah, 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 you know you're wrong. Um, that caused more push-ups. Um, not, not, not highly recommended. Um, but challenge the why. Right, you gotta know when to challenge it. That would be a good time. You got a good soldier that should be a sergeant. Why wouldn't you challenge that? And then don't let people tell you no. And so you, gotta, you can't do it on every little thing, but when it comes to certain things, I would say, when is a great time to challenge it? Pay is like number one, right? Promotions, which is pay, is right there, right? Challenge that. If it's something to get them to pay or a promotion, the school I immediately caught my attention, right? Because as a young sergeant, I would have challenged that. And now as an old sergeant major of the Army, it's easy for me to challenge. Like, hey, we'll get her to school. Like when? Now? But as a, I was not really different as a young sergeant. And that's what I would ask you to do. Challenge, when you don't get the why and you don't feel like you're getting it, maybe at the appropriate time, you know, not in a gunfight. Hey, why are we doing this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, look, <laughs> go for it, okay? Um, but say, hey, was that why? And, and you should be, a, as much as you can, as an NCO for the rest of your life, please try to tell your soldiers why. And it, it may not, and if you don't know, ask. And it may be really, really hard. And I'll give you an example. I'm in Iraq, and it's hard to explain to your soldiers why in one street you're passing out soccer balls and the other side of the street you're killing people or somebody's trying to kill you. And like, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And, it, and, and when you've had a death in your organization, it's really hard from combat to, to kind of reconcile the why. But you have to as a leader for your soldiers. Um, it may be really hard. And that was, that was a personal situation for me. And it was really hard. But you had to. OK? Yes? Uh, Sir Major, if you ask and they don't give you the response or give you the answer, what then? What's our next step? Push back. Same thing with me. If he, I, I don't like your answer, sorry, Major. Now you got to do it respectful. And I don't. Um, some people. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Some people don't like that. And I, I don't even be well. 
it's also officers and enlisted, but I've, I've seen quite a few officers don't really like when I challenge that. So, um, but I do. You may not like my answer, but I'm going to tell you what I think. But I would say push back. Say, hey, I, I, I really don't feel like... Now, if you after the fourth time, they just say, hey, we're not going to do it. I don't know. Um, you probably should just stop. Okay? Um, but it's okay to sometimes say, can you tell me why? And if they tell you why and you don't like the answer and you keep pushing, then you just don't like the answer. I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, I could tell you a ton of things that I've said, and I was like, hey, we're not going to do that as an army, and I told you why, and then you go, but I want you to. I'm like, okay, I've told you why. Now I'm just telling you, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, but it's okay, and some people don't like that. Uh, I'm not that one. Uh, I want you to challenge me because it's going to make me better. And if enough people challenge me the right way, and I'm listening the right way, maybe I'll change a policy. Um, I'll give you a parenthood. So this is a, a good example, right? I was challenged several times in my first year about, and I, I don't think I was listening the right thing. They kept saying we need uh, better parenthood policy. And uh, I was like, well, we got a parenthood policy. Um, and it, it really didn't cover single parents very well. And it talked, but so I listened finally, and then they sent me uh, a recommendation to change. And they kept challenging me on our policy, which were incorrect. And eventually, we actually, I think last year, was a year and a half ago, we actually challenged, we uh, printed out a new parenthood policy. That came because a group of people in a small group like this uh, didn't like the Army policy. I pushed back, they pushed back, and then finally I listened, uh, and then we changed the policy. So, but at some point, you know, there will be, there may be a point where the leader just says, hey, but if you feel strong enough, what are you going to do? Are you willing to go? And I'll, I'll give the, where I was willing to go anywhere. I and mean, my, my NCOs have heard me say this about a thousand times. I was a young sergeant and it was pay. And uh, one of my soldiers was special. I was a sergeant, not staff sergeant, sergeant, E5, specialist. Pay was messed up. It's gone on for months. And I went to the S1 at the time. The S1 did the paperwork. You know, it's not like Ipsa, you submit it, but they actually do the paperwork to fix the pay. And gone on for months. They submitted the paperwork. They lost it. They lost it. I walked in. I said, you're going to fix this paperwork right now. I'm not leaving. You know, sergeant, you know, wielding all that authority, right, in the S1 shop. So the staff sergeant comes out and says, Sergeant Grinson, you need to leave. I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't understand what I just told you. I'm not leaving until you fix the pay. And then the Sergeant First Class came out. He tried to tell me the same thing. And I told him, I said, there are two ways. You're either going to fix that paperwork or you're going to throw me out of here. And I'm, I got the time. There was no 42 Alpha in the Army that was going to throw me out of any S1 shop. So <laughs> I just graduated range school. I was like, I was on it, man. I was like, this is this. I'm either going to get court-martialed or they were fixed that pay. Well, I guess good news for me, or maybe bad news for you. <laughs> I was not a court martial. <laughs> so, uh, and they did the paperwork. And I didn't go with a throwdown in the S1 shop. But uh, I was willing to go that, to that level. And that is a 100% true story. Um, that guy got out of the Army and is my best friend to this day. Came to my house. I said, hey, I'm buying a new house and need some work. He said, I'll be there. That's been 30, it was 32 years ago. <laughs> so I was willing to not make one other rank and go to jail for that because they'd screwed up his pay. Um, only you can decide that. As a sergeant, you can raise a report anytime. You don't have to be a sharp rep. So we already have that. <laughs> so anybody in this room says, hey, something wasn't reported, I can report it. You know that, right? So I don't need you to make a sharp riff. Um, and why do we have it as only staff sergeants? We get that a lot. I'm, I'm really cautious to lower it, right? There's a level of maturity to deal with some really difficult situations. Those are very emotional, bad things, when bad things happen. And young, younger people may not you know, deal with that the appropriate way. 
um, mentally they may not be ready for that. So I'm very cautious to say, hey, let's do this for a uh, sergeant and let them be a sharp rep. But here's something I would like. Imagine that we didn't have to have sarks and sharp. Wouldn't that be great? What if we just, just kind of eliminated sexual assault in the Army? That's what I'd like and not add more sarks and lower to sergeants and specialists. So I'd really like to see us do better with sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, that's what I really want. And stop adding more people to respond to sexual assault. So we go, oh, let's, but we don't go after stopping it. And somebody said, well, I want, you know, all these people to do it. And I go, we have all these people, everybody in this room. <laughs> it's like, if you, it's like, if somebody is doing something they shouldn't be doing it, you should stop it. <laughs> so you think I was bad for pay. Uh, imagine what, I had a soldier, somebody said something, one of my soldiers one time. I was a battalion sergeant major, I was in the child, remember I had stories for everything. I'm in the child line and there was a young woman in front of me and she was like, and the, the guy behind the counter, I thought he said something that was just a little inappropriate. I almost come over the counter. That was the battalion sergeant. I said, you ever say that again? Ever. Why? Like, ever. You will no longer be in the Army. And that, the kid's face was like, I mean, I almost come over the top of the counter. He understood what I got. He understood that I was not going to tolerate that in my organization. We need everybody to have that. And stop trying to add more people to respond after you've been harassed or assaulted. Let's get rid of harassment and assault. All of us. So I've been in the Army so long that we were not in combat when I came in the Army. Right? 1987. So I came in the Army in 87. We, had not, we came out of Vietnam. Last person to leave Vietnam, I'm pretty sure, it was about 1975. So that, that period of time. And then we had Desert Shield, that storm. We went, rolled months tanks. We wiped them through. Then we all left. So really from 90, so we weren't prolonged, and I'm a Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Prepared. So from 90 to 2001, that's 10 years where really there wasn't a lot of combat. And you're right. So I, as a young soldier, we idolized the Vietnam veterans, right? Like you are looking at the, you know, the Iraq, and they're talking about, ah, oh, look at my patches. Um, it's just a patch, just to let you know. So there's this long period of time, 10 years that I was in the Army, basically, that we did not have troops in combat, 90 to 90, 2001. Um, so I remember that, and I, I, and I was a young, you know, sergeant, staff sergeant at that time. So right at your level, right at, what did I do with that? Well, unfortunately, remember that standards thing? <laughs> so uh, you didn't have to worry about combat. Anything that I'd put you through in training was probably much harder than what I saw in combat. So my advice to you all is, those people telling you stories about my day and all that other stuff, first of all, just any, when they start with that, just disregard it. <laughs> just say, okay, I really appreciate your comments. Every combat deployment I've had, they've all been different. So why do you try to use this one for that one? It's unreasonable anyway. So OIF-2 is different between OIF-4. Desert Shield is different than, than Afghanistan. It's all different. So I think sometimes they like to use this, and you put them sometimes in those predicaments that they, they want to over-glamorize that. That's number one. Number two, you all join the Army. And you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. And I think that's the thing that we forget. That's the thing we tried not to forget in the 90s. We trained exceptionally hard in the case that we had to go to war, but we didn't. And we did it again and again. But when we went, we were really good. And I think what we're struggling with now is where you think, number one, you think you're in a peacetime, which you're absolutely incorrect. Uh, last week, we had soldiers, soldiers wounded in combat. So we still have soldiers wounded. Uh, there was a civilian killed by a one-way UAV attack in Syria two weeks ago. So there are, you know, all components, soldiers, fighting and getting wounded in combat right now. So I will caution you of that. Um, now on the other half of that is, I hope you don't go to combat. 
but you have to be prepared. And that's the problem that we feel like, you know, that mid, you know, Sergeant First Class, Battalion, and Brigade are like, yeah, this is all much crap because we're not going anywhere, right? They're, they're absolutely wrong. Um, you have to train like you're going to go to the worst scenario. And if you never go, I will be so happy. But you have to be ready. So I just did an article. Yep. Um, somebody asked me about this. And somebody said, why? You know, uh, uh, you know, people first, right? You're not taking our peer, care of our people. We're going to the CTC rotation. We're doing all this stuff in the training. We're going to the field. And I said, do you think I could explain to your mother when you died, if you went to combat, that you weren't well trained? How do you think that would go? That would not go well. So, when you think of should I go to the field and train, think, am I doing everything to prepare my soldiers in the case that we had to go to combat? And every day you get up, you should have that same way. And I did that for 10 years. When I woke up as a young staff sergeant, that PT session was going to be so hard because I wanted to make sure that if I got in combat, that they would be strong enough to carry my body and I would be strong enough to carry theirs. And for 10 years, I never had to worry about that. But for 10 years, I prepared for that. And you don't want to be actually the one doing that, for real, and I don't want you to be there. But if you're not ready, think about what I just said. Are you prepared to call somebody's parent and say, I did not prepare them for that? And wake up that day and say, okay, am I doing everything I can to do the best that they're trained? And the, if you don't go, guess what? None of you have any authority to do anything with that. It takes an order from Congress to the president, president to the Secretary of Defense to order us to go anywhere. You act like we're sitting in the building going, hey, let's go to combat. <laughs> so we don't do that. Right, so, so those people, they, you know, I think we put too much emphasis on this sometimes, especially, now trust me, I, I'm very proud of my time in combat, um, but that's not who I am. That doesn't define me because I was ordered to go. I was in a really crappy situation. I got shot at, blown up, and all these other things. I mean, I didn't elect to go do, hey, could you shoot at me with that RPG real quick? You know, so uh, just happened to be in a crappy situation. That doesn't define who I was as a leader. And that shouldn't define you as a leader either. Every month, worldwide, if you're a nominative star major, usually at an installation, we look at your sexual assault and sexualized numbers for that post worldwide. And we look at it from prevention though. So I'll tell you this thing, 91% of all your laws are response. And you, you all love it. You wanna add more sexual assault response coordinators. That's response, the sexual, that didn't prevent it. You're just adding somebody to respond to it. So what I did is how do we actually prevent it? Um, so we have a meeting that talks about prevention and I've been doing it for two years and I could tell you where every installation has, and we put it up on a screen and uh, there were not, last, it was like a week ago, 90 uh, nominative star majors in the Army. There's 300 in the Army, there were 90 on that screen. Um, all the way from Korea to Europe to Arsene and we go, okay, how do we prevent these things from happening? And we look at when a new soldier comes to the unit, do we have a reception company? So we've added these reception companies, so we welcome them into the unit. Because I think if you're a part of my team, we wouldn't harass you, insult you. So we've been looking at this. There's nothing preventing me from trying to do uh, everything. But I'll caution you, a lot of those reports usually look like, smell like response. Uh, I'm looking at to prevent. And most people aren't comfortable with this. Um, I mean, I've, I've said it in testimony, I've said I want zero. The only way I can do that is you all feel like you have the authority to make a correction. But you don't. 
you don't even know the standard sometimes. So if you don't know the standard, that's why I read all those manuals. If you don't know, <laughs> okay, I know you know how to read, but you know you should read it and say that's not correct. And even if, you, if it's just your gut feeling, you should make the correction. Um, but I personally look at those numbers every week and we get everybody up on the, the net and we try to say what can we do to prevent it. Um, so if you want us to tick, yes I did this, yes I did that, I think you're wrong. That GA report, we could check off every one of those check marks, right? And if I don't apply leadership every month to say, I don't look at that GAO report. I look at where your sexual assault numbers on Fort Carson, <laughs> right? And the leader, the division star major is on the net. And if they spike, I go, okay, what did we, what programs did we have or didn't have that didn't tell us to prevent that? Um, but I will caution you, we like to get reports and then we like to check the block and go down the checklist. I added two more SARCs, I took away the, uh, the, collateral dam uh, the collateral NCO duties, we took that out, right? I'm not doing that. I'm looking at your numbers and saying, what, what are we doing to make people part of a team that we didn't think that was right? And we look at it every week. Um, but I will caution you, a lot of people want us to check everything they do. Um, and I think that's the wrong approach and I've stopped doing that. In my office on Monday, um, uh, Monday I was in a really bad mood and I didn't tell anybody and they all were like, oh he's on pins and needles. One person came to my office, Dr. Sorrell, she said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm having a bad day. I never told them why. Um, on April 9th, um, that happened in, uh, in 2004 was a Friday. I had soldiers around me killed. They were all dead, my soldiers. That was April 9th. Um, on April 10th was Monday, this Monday. And so I was in an extremely foul mood. Um, somebody that night had sent me a text said, after all these years, it's so painful that I lost my best friend. Um, and they sent that to me. Um, and I knew, of course, I was standing right there. I never told them that I actually was standing right there. They knew I was in the unit, but they didn't know that I was, I was the only one alive at that moment. Um, that's April 9th, 2004. On April 10th, I was in a really bad mood. It was right after Easter, but I was just foul. Um, one person in the office asked me and said, hey, are you okay? I think we all need to do that. I'm not gonna add more people. Why can't you just say, you seem a little more, now I'm, I'm a mean, grumpy person <laughs> in the office, <laughs> so uh, it's really hard to tell when I'm actually abnormally hateful. Um, not say hateful, just, you know, just how I am sometimes, but that's where I'd really like us to see us go. Notice that there's something off and just ask a very simple question. You okay? You seem a little different today. And I'm not going to, like, why? Why can't, why can't you just ask that question? So I sit on a panel, and it's all the senior sergeant majors in the Army, right? I'll explain to you who they are. The Force Com, the TRADOC, the, the Army Material Command. Um, so these are the top 10 senior people in the Army. 50% uh, are some race other than white. Uh, there are two women. Uh, at one point we had one Hispanic. We have African Americans. So could you narrow this down? What senior leaders are you talking about? I mean, like the chief of the staff of the Army is a white male. Now, I'll just let you know, there's only one chief of staff of the Army. Uh, but the, when you look at the Army staff, general officers, the G2 is a woman. The Secretary of the Army is a woman. Um, we've had a woman as a Division Sergeant Major, Veronica Knapp, in the 101st. I just saw her yesterday. I'm sorry, Thursday. 
Um, my XO, Sergeant Major Brady, is a three-star nominative Sergeant Major. She's a woman. Uh, we had a woman compete to be the Sergeant Major of the Army. So what higher-ups are we talking about? You're saying we've never had a, something as a chief, but there's only one. So it doesn't matter what we pick. It's going to be wrong, right? You know, It's like, oh, it's not my race. So I think you don't, you're not giving us enough credit. 